Hello, and welcome to the 25th Hour, a newscast produced by the Carleton University School of Journalism. I'm Julia Moran. And I'm Maz Adda. Thanks for joining us. We've spent the last month speaking to people around Ottawa making a difference in their communities. Today, we're sharing their stories with you. Later, we'll meet a Carleton student who shares her powerful poetry to help survivors of sexual assault to heal. A book lover living his entrepreneurial dream. And a five-year-old girl whose chalk drawings are brightening up her entire neighborhood. Our first story takes us to the upcoming municipal elections. Cameron Rose Jetty is a transgender Carleton student living with a disability. They want to even the political playing field. That's why they're running for city councillor in Ward 19. I would say my entire life I'm on guard because every time that I try to do something, there's often something that's a barrier for me. My name is Cameron Rose Jetty. I'm a third year student here at Carleton in the Human Rights and Social Justice program, minoring in religion and American Sign Language. I am a student leader. I am the counselor for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and I'm also running for city council in Ward 19. So I thought, as a young person, and as a trans person, as a disabled person, I'd never seen someone like me, or someone who experiences the world in the ways I do, um, on council, um, or in any elected position in most levels of government, um, if not all. And so I thought, if no one else is going to do it, maybe it should be me. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what you do, um, what you can, can't do, things like that, you can still be part of your community. You can still run and you can still represent your community in, um, in municipal government, in government in general, in any sort of way. Um, that it's not just for this one group of people, that anybody and everybody should be able to, and um, I hope in the, in the future is encouraged to run or to be involved in a variety of different ways. So my pronouns are they and them. Um, I prefer those pronouns because they take a little bit of the genderedness, well, they take the gendered kind of ness of uh, typical pronouns um, away, and I just kind of feel like that fits with me, and I've been using those pronouns since I was in like 11th grade, so it's just kind of become a part of my life now. The hardest part for me about running for city council has definitely been the inaccessibility of politics in general. That, that kind of encapsulates my disability as a whole, is just pain um, and inability to kind of function in the way that most people can function. If I'm struggling with something, there's likely someone who is close to me that can either help or that's also going through something similar that I can kind of have that relate, relatability with. That's relatability. I grew up in Ottawa, sure. my family's in Ottawa, I'm in Ottawa, so I have people like that. So I have people, I have family that can support me. I really had to um, take my campaign online and do a lot of social media outreach and also just trying to reach people through different events, through the debates that I'm doing. So I really tried to take on as much of that uh, as possible, so if I get a debate request, I do it. That's like when I did the like debate with the youth, like I tried to be like, you know what, I'm a youth too. And I was where you were at one point, and you can be where I am at some point. And that's, I think, the best thing you can say to somebody. In the process of trying to get into these programs, we need to take a harm reduction. The way my education is going would definitely be changed a lot if I were to win. Um, also, I think, just the way I live my life would be, a, I, it would be a lot more accessible to me because I would have the finances to be able to make life more accessible. So what I think I'm really trying to do with this, with this election and hopefully by winning is providing a voice on council um, in the decision making process that, that considers the voices and the needs and the experiences of people who are currently not being represented and um, I think that's really what I'm what I'm trying to do is give the voice to the voiceless. Transgender rights are at the front of today's political discussion. Jetty themselves identifies using gender-neutral pronouns, they, them, and their. 
we spoke to Professor Cara Tierney from the University of Ottawa to explain what this means. You know, a lot of people are like nervous, like, oh, I don't want to get it wrong. Just asking. It's the simplest. It's the same that you do when you ask someone their name, right? So what's your name? Oh, what pronoun do you use? Um, and so I, I, I run workshops where we'll have people practice doing that. Um, but yeah, hi, my name is Cara Tierney. I use they, them pronouns. So I don't identify as a man and I don't identify as a woman. Um, and so I do not use he or she because those are inaccurate reflections of who I am. And the singular they, them pronoun uh, avoids that uh, encounter with gender that is built into our language that doesn't account for my identity, right? So the trick really is not to like stop and make like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I did that. Wow, I'm so sorry. Because when you do that, you're just sort of drawing more attention to it. And then you're asking that person to, to do this sort of emotional labor and help you feel better about this mistake that you made and really just move on from it and get it right the next time is kind of the easiest way to, to blow through that. Um, but then I'm always here to have that conversation with anyone who wants to because I, I invite that work and that, that dialogue that needs to keep happening, right? If we don't talk about it, nothing's going to change. Jetty's politics aim to uplift voices not often heard. Another Ottawa resident is doing the same thing. Elizabeth Pepra started a support group called the Survivor's Boat to help women who have experienced sexual assault. Together, they use poems to heal and grow. Have you ever flirted with death? See, I may be a beauty, but excuse me. Have you ever considered the broken condition of my inward heart? I've played these games of silent deceit for so long that it's become an art. Stop looking at me. I used to be afraid of eyes, the lies. I let the devil convince myself, made me put my self-confidence on a shelf, paralyzed by fear just so that you wouldn't hear my story. It's pretty gory. My story, gory. My name is Elizabeth Pepra. I am a Carleton University student. I am currently finishing my master's degree in Women and Gender Studies, and I am the founder of The Survivor's Boat. So The Survivor's Boat is a rescue network for female survivors of sexual violence. As a child, I was touched, and mind you, I didn't say much about my story. Slightly gory, my story, gory. It came out of this vision I had um, of being in this boat, and there were um, women who were survivors of different types of sexual trauma, uh, whether it be molestation, rape, sexual assault, and they were um, crippled by the assault, crippled by the trauma. And so I saw myself within a boat um, picking up and like rescuing these women who've been through things that I've been through. And as they get on the boat, we're all traveling together towards, um, towards healing, towards restoration, and towards like a new chapter within our lives. And this thing that happened when I was young, created a cycle that I tried to escape and run from. I really couldn't have fun. My life seemed done. Part two. I didn't know him, but he touched me. His face I still see. I'm in my teens, innocent, on my way from work, but the jerk he took apart from me. The summer before grad school, so um, 2016, I was assaulted. It was on the way home from church, actually. I don't want to go into too much detail, but it was a stranger and I didn't know him. And that assault was um, so jarring to me because it actually um, triggered um, the pain that and the trauma that I went through in my childhood from being molested. And I never dealt with that. So as a child, the sexual violence was far from mild, a satanic swirl. She's such a beautiful little girl. I knew equity services existed, but there's such a stigma associated with that. Even walking into that building, I was like, you know, I don't want to call myself a victim. I don't want to be a survivor. I don't want to be labeled or grouped into something like that. A lot of friends, they do kind of blame you and they do kind of victim blame as in, you know, like some people said things like, um, did you want it? What were you wearing? Where were you? Um, were you drunk? It's like, I, I don't even drink. So, you know, it's things like that where it's like, I can't understand. Um, there's just so many stereotypes. So support, uh, to the extent that I wish I had, no. Many hands on me. I just wanted to be free. 
told none. So at 23, could you blame me for contemplating a gun? And that's why I'm trying to offer survivors a means of support. I'm trying to like fill in the gap for what I didn't have, that they would have it. Because support, not really, to be honest. As a child molested, as a teen tested, as a young adult, it was my fault. My mind existed in a bind and you couldn't see it. How could you? So I began writing poetry to express myself and to work through things. And I even used it as kind of like, um, it's kind of like a prayer, like whenever I'd write these things out, like it was like, it was a holy thing. It was like a sacred thing. It was like, I don't know, I found it so deep and so liberating. And I found that if that helped me, if that was a form of healing to me, um, I believe that other women and other survivors can experience that healing and that freedom through this art form as well. So I'm also currently working on a book called A Cloud of Witnesses, Poems for Survivors. So basically, there's a group of women who have been where we've been, who have been molested, who have been raped, they've been traumatized, and they're with us, they're with survivors, they're surrounding us and they're cheering us on. So when you believe that no one has seen your pain, no one, has, no one experiences what you've experienced, no one understands you, the survivors, the cloud of witnesses are with you. One of my poems called Me Too um, talks about like one of the darkest periods of my life and it starts off by saying something like um, I once considering my mur I once considered murdering myself me too and it's um it's not that I like wrote out like a suicide letter and was like you know really going to kill myself but I felt as if I was dead so suicide wasn't even an option because I was already dead I was the walking dead and you blame me for trying to escape the world and join a convent. And you blame me for defending myself, no matter the content. And you blame me for not trusting you, saying I should sue. And you couldn't see it, how could you? And you blame me, but it wasn't me. It was one plus three. Pepra is writing a book she's hoping to publish in January. But she's not the only one spreading a message through books. One Sandy Hill man has transformed his home into a sanctuary for the written word. Scott McKillop runs Barely Bruised Book Club. Here's his story. Yeah, hi, I'm Scott McKillop, the owner of the Barely Bruised Book Club. This is my home. This is my life. Uh, 24 hours a day, um, every waking hour is just books with me. Um, uh, from the hunting um, to posting them on Facebook, taking photos. Um, I don't think um, parents should have to buy children's books just because there's so many parents that have already bought them and they're giving them away, they're don't, they have nowhere to do it. And if I can get them donated, I want to donate them back to, to the people. Um, I just want people to keep reading books. And if I can do that, if I can get them reading when they're four and five, or two and three, or seven or eight, perfect. Um, if not, I'll try my best to get them reading as adults. <laughs> A lot of my members are indigenous. Um, I'm part indigenous, I love these books, and uh, I, that's my pride and joy. I got tons of books too that are five dollars and under, and a lot. I always have free books outside. Besides the kids' books, I put a free box of kids' books outside. The kids' books are always free. I put a box of adult books down there every day that are free too. I'm going to be here f until next June for sure. I may not be in this building um, the following year. I hope I am, uh, but I am kind of looking for a larger space uh, because I have 80,000 titles and I can only fit about eight in here. The Indigenous artist here um, I used to deliver her books because she couldn't, sure, yeah, she couldn't get to me. And, uh, but now every poetry night, she takes a paratranspo here and uh, makes it upstairs. And yeah, she's here every single time. 
Yeah, he, he would deliver them right to the door and even through winter, you know, through storms, yeah. So we kind of, you know, he's a good friend now for, to my daughter and I. So. And I, I really appreciate people like that and uh, it shows how much they appreciate what I'm doing and that's, that's what makes me happy. That's what makes me happy. It's this simple. Go to the polls. Vote for the man who's out on parole. Now, as much as I want you to vote for me, you cannot vote for me tonight. Jared is the first poet. Let's get up. Yeah. Camera's out, guys. Camera's out. Scott McKillop finds power in pages, but Anne Wright finds her power on canvas. She uses her heated beeswax to create detailed works of abstract art. Her work explores themes of ancestry, identity, and poetry. But most of all, she believes art is a tool to speak up for the voiceless. To me, art is something that takes me by the hand and leads me deeper into my life. My name's Anne Wright, and I am an encaustic artist, and I'm also a half-time life coach. A lot of people say, what is that? I, what I do is I work with beeswax and resin, which gets melted. Let's do it here. And then I add pigment to it, and um, it, it's, it's a medium similar to oil actually, except the wax gives the work a whole lot more texture. You can put something down and then you apply heat through a torch gun or a heat gun. The art changes as soon as you apply the heat and things start to emerge. This is the way that I'm finding my way into my own life now, and it's brought me, to, you know, to here in Canada, saying, what can I do around the whole reconciliation piece around um, how we come to terms with the ways in which we've gained advantage by having come from the colonial heritage. And I worked on this big piece that I spent six months doing. It was a very tragic piece because it was inspired by that horrible, horrible fire that happened over in London, Grenfell Tower. Each one of these represents a household where someone was lost. It's what grabbed me, and I, I started with a few things, and then I thought, I'll do one for every household. So let us die to make things cheap is what the graffiti is, and. That's from a Leonard Cohen song. It feels like these people died to make things cheap for the rest of us. So that really reinforced for me, and that's actually part of what brought me to the whole reconciliation thing here, because that's the thing that I think, you know, I, I have this colonial privilege that's been gifted to me by the family I was born into. Their workshops and retreats to support people to really listen to what's coming through them, through their their hands and their their own creative impulse. Oh, I, I'm still doing painting part time, so um, but I do call myself a professional artist now. <laughs> Cute. Now I'm going to look at it and see a little bug every time I look at it. <laughs> you know, you might not think of yourself as an art of artist, but we are, all of us are creating all the time in our own lives. We're creating each day. Many students know how difficult it can be to balance schoolwork, part-time jobs, and self-care. Kira Kowalski has found a unique way to manage her stress and make a profit. Um, my name is Kira Kowalski, I'm 21 years old, and I'm an embroiderer. So I started over January, so about nine months ago, and uh, it just started as a hobby. 
watched a few YouTube videos and it kind of took off from there and then I ended up being decent at it. My mom told me I was decent at it. Uh, my first piece was actually like a bikini piece and I posted it. I was like, oh, I'll start an Instagram, like whatever. I can just share it with people. And then I got a really good response. I'm like, you know what? Like I could probably sell it. I can make a little bit of money and it just took off from there. So I called my business None of Us the Same. It was kind of me being super creative because, I don't know, why not? Um, I was just in bed one night being like, okay, well, if I'm going to have a business, I guess I have to brand myself and have a name. And I didn't want it to be embroidery by Kira because I feel that can get lost and I wanted something that stuck out. So I chose None of Us the Same because I think that none of my pieces will ever be the same. And I've told people that. So if they send me a design that they want, I'm like, it's not going to look exactly like that. It'll either be my interpretation of it or it'll be just like slightly different. Um, and I think that handmade gifts and handmade art is so special because it's not, I'm not a machine. I'm not re like reproducing things, you know? It's my own take on things. So none of them will ever be the same. So I'm a bit of a worry wart. Like I'm always thinking ahead, always thinking about the future, always just worrying about things in general because I do have anxiety. Embroidery is kind of just a time for me to take my mind off things and not have to worry about it. Like even though it's a business, I'm not worried about it, I guess. But it is my art form and it's how I express myself and it's how I de-stress. get stressed out a lot with school. I'm in like a demanding program, journalism. So for me, just taking a couple hours out of my day just at the end of the night to unwind and have my embroidery and just kind of like take my mind off things is super therapeutic for me. And I think that, I don't know, I would recommend it to anyone who's looking to de-stress because you just don't really think about it. And you just, I don't know, just stitch, it's fun. I think that anxiety is kind of a term that's almost overused to the point where people don't quite understand it because it is so hard to explain and everyone feels it differently. It's a feeling. It's hard to put into words. It's, I don't even know how to explain how I feel a lot of the days. I don't necessarily feel it every day. It's, it can come and go. Yeah, like, and even anxiety doesn't mean that you're depressed or that you're sad all the time. It just means that maybe you're hard on yourself. It has so many different meanings for so many different people. Even people with anxiety, like maybe they need to be around people to feel better or maybe they need to be alone to feel better. Like, it, I guess it depends. Everyone copes with it differently. I happen to cope with it through embroidery. So myself, I am Métis. You probably wouldn't know that by looking at me, but I am, and it's something that I do want to explore more. And I hope to, after journalism school, go to um, University of Winnipeg and do my master's in Indigenous Development. That's the plan right now. Um, and in terms of embroidery, I don't want to stop doing it, um, especially like after I go and graduate from that degree and get a job, I hope that it's always something that I can rely on as a stress reliever and maybe a means of a little bit of money. It doesn't have to be, but I know that I'll probably always do it. Everything translates through my embroidery. Like I'm inspired by stuff all the time that I want to stitch. So I'm sure that the two will meld once I learn more about my past. Like the feeling of giving someone something and them receiving it and just loving it, it's also just a great feeling in return. And that's kind of why I keep doing it too, because it makes people happy. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. John Felice Soprano doesn't care about preserving his art. Every summer, he spends days building rock sculptures beside the Ottawa River. Every winter, 
they fall apart. We spoke with him to understand why he keeps coming back year after year. The balancing itself came out of an understanding that when things are balanced, everything is in harmony and everything moves along without resistance. My name is John Felice Ciprano. I've been working here on the site creating stone or rock balanced sculptures for 32 years. I was just simply looking for a place where I could be at peace with myself uh, and the world around me in particular, and I needed some water. I needed to be by the river. I leave myself completely open to what the rock can show me in terms of a composition, a form, its texture, and its color. All those things matter to me as an artist almost like a painter. When it comes time to build the sculptures, I'm in the river, I use the currents of the river, the angle of the sun, and everything else to determine how I orient each piece. When I discovered this place and the rocks that were here, and I started to construct things, it was an automatic, uncontrived, definitely mindless approach that everything had to be balanced and fit together naturally, and then I added on to that to appear as though it had been there forever. Each year is a different installation. Each year there's nothing when I start, and when winter comes, everything takes it away all over again. You know, we keep on trying as a species to control our environment and our world around us, and that's impossible. Nature has its own course, you know? If it's inconvenient for us, uh, that's okay. Nature's not about to change its course for our sake. All of my best friends are gone. They've all died. When it first started to happen, it was really shocking. And then as time went on, you know, you just kind of say, well, this is part of life. And the best thing about letting go that I've learned is that when you let go, you evolve to the next level of your own evolution. As the season comes to an end out here, I, uh, I don't know, I move with it. In other words, I realize it is a seasonal affair. Winter comes, of course, the river is going to take everything away. And my attitude is, well, nature gave me all this wonderful stuff to work with, to experience a very luxurious, wonderful time with life. So when it comes time that nature wants to take it away, it's a loan. And I thank you very much for the good loan. As far as I'm concerned, it's thrilling to see how nature does it. John Felice Soprano has been creating art all his life, but Libia Bella proves that anyone can be an artist at any age. She's only five, and already she's turned her street into a canvas and brightened up her neighborhood in the process. I love, love, love chalk and drawing on the sidewalk and stuff like that. I'm Libby and I'm like five, I'm five and three quarters. Why do I like art? Because, um, because it makes everything look really nice. Pokemon. <laughs> Pikachu. Nobody minds her drawing on their sidewalk. My name is Carrie and I am Libby's mom. There's six giant
chalkboard panels, right? She started to write little notes for neighbors, um, the ones that she's friends with. Um, she has adult neighbor friends that she likes to talk to and write little notes for. And I think that really creates a sense of, certainly a sense of belonging for her, um, that she has friends and she can write them little notes, but also a real, a real sense of pride in the community and, and the neighborhood itself. Whoa. It's just such a wonderful part of our community and you know you just feel so welcome all the time with, with Libby. Dad looks like a bug but she would know what kind of bug because she loves bugs. I don't know what that is. Um, you know we just rely on, on her art every single day to change the way that our street looks and we love everything she does. Because <laughs> I'm always drawing. Every day. I draw. And the sidewalks usually Ball. The other day I told her that we haven't had any art in front of our house. What's going on? Like are we banned or something? And then we went out for the weekend and then when we got home, not only our, um, our sidewalk had been covered in art. That guy totally that guy looks like a looks lizard. Like a that guy looks oh, like a lizard too. Totally but the whole driveway <laughs> had been covered in art and it was kind of like the Sistine Chapel. It was like all these characters that were playing together. It was really amazing. Like like, like big messages on the sidewalk. Um, my imagination, like just my imagination and nothing else. I'm surprised by the level of her imagination and also how she can take it and put it onto paper and explain it as a five and a half year old. Here's some more. Here's, do you know how to tell time? Oh, not really. <laughs> I forget. That's okay. There is a uh, professor on the street who teaches her some math or gives her some math problems and um, she, wrote, she writes I heart math and I love binary code <laughs> for him often. Sometimes she writes birthday messages for people. Oh yeah, I did that birthday card was for Springfield Elementary School Chalkboard. It was like I love hugs, I love hugs, I love hugs, I love hugs. It said I love hugs. Um, when the neighbors had a baby last year, she said, welcome home and wrote his name, which was really nice. Um, but she does make up her own creatures and then draws her own creature. And they, she comes up with these stories about them, which is, uh, which is pretty amazing. So they're sort of like comic books. Some, some of the different sidewalk, uh, streets are like different panels for her comic books. It's the neighborhood I want to see for my kid. Um, certainly, uh, where she has a sense of belonging, but also that she's, free to draw and that people are welcoming in, um, in having her draw, uh, not necessarily on their house, but um, certainly on their walkways or on the sidewalk in front of their house. Nobody has ever said anything negative about it. So. We usually have a lot of, of, sometimes I have a lot of details or we look realistic and sometimes I might do a sketch before actually drawing. And try to solve all that. Whoa, that is a very good R2D2. I know. You know? Usually, anything inspired by my imagination, that's usually what I'm drawing. And I love when everyone loves it, so, ta da! That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed our wonderful stories from Canada's capital. Thanks for tuning in with us here on the 25th hour. For more great content, you can visit our website or follow us on social media. We hope you'll tune in again next time. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>